Good morning. I, um, as I promised, I hung a, a link to a very nice summary article about deep networks um, off of the course web page. I very much encourage you to uh, look at it, try to read it. It's very, very readable. It's, you know, it's not uh, technical, which is one of the things I like about Jeff Hinton's work. He is a way of describing it. You know, it's basically how I learned my teaching style, trying to explain the essence of it uh, and not get bogged down in the equation. So I really recommend that article. Um, do you have any questions or comment or suggestions about deep learning in general? Because we're about to leave that topic. OK. So uh, we're going to move uh, deep into probability and statistics. Uh, and most of the rest of the, of the course would be uh, statistical flavor of, <clears throat> of machine learning which is really the dominant flavor these days, except for deep learning, which is, has some statistical interpretation, but it's uh, also kind of an engineering uh, way of thinking. Um, let me start by asking you a simple question. Uh, you all know what independence means, independence of two random variables. You should all know what it means. That was a rhetorical question. Um, <laughs> Do you remember the definition? Random variables x and y are independent means, if and only if, or means that for every x in x and for every y in y, the joint probability of um, I'll write it first fully, x equals x and y equals y equals the probability of x equals x times the probability of y equals y. I apologize for the people on the side. I'll write it again here in shorthand. P of x comma y equals P of x times P of y. The joint is equal to the product of the marginals. You should know this by heart in your sleep. Uh, my next question is, do you know what this means? X is independent of Y conditioned on Z. This is called conditional independence. It's very similar. It means that for every X, Y, and Z, in X, Y, and Z, the joint of X and Y conditioned on, Z, on the value of Z is equal to X conditioned on Z times Y conditioned on Z. It's exactly the same formula, but everything is conditioned on the value of Z. If you still remember information theory, these direct uh, analogies, in fact, they're not analogies, they're mathematical equivalents. This is the same as, start with here, this is the same as mutual information between x and y is zero. And this is the same as mutual information between x and y conditioned on knowing z is zero. Now I have a question for you. All this you should have known. You should know very well. Now I have a question for you. Um, which of these two conditions is more strict? And which is more general? Like if you know that X is independent of Y, can you conclude that X is conditionally independent of Y conditioned on Z? All right, at least some people say yes. Or, if you know that x is conditionally independent of y, conditioned on z, can you conclude from that that x is independent of y? That you say no. So, 
for this direction, I get some votes. Yes, raise your hand. Okay, for this direction, I get votes. No. Okay, this is wrong. This is wrong. Neither one um, implies the other. You could have a situation with one holding and the other not holding. In fact, what about x independent of y conditioned on w, some other random variable? The answer is, this could be true and this not true, or the other way around, or neither could be true, or both could be true. Everything is possible. You cannot uh, conclude one from the other. Um, so conditional independence does not imply independence. Independence does not imply conditional independence. And specifically, conditional independence depends on what you're conditioning on. Condition on one thing, it holds. Condition on another thing, it doesn't hold. OK, keep that in mind. The other thing I want to point out is that I used individual random variables, but you can replace any one of these with a set of random variables. Because remember that a set of random variables can always be thought of as a random variable. Right? You just put curly brackets around them and voila, you have a new random variable. Which means that I can look at things like this. The way I read this is x is condition independent of y, conditioned on w and z. And I can put here another uh, in fact, instead of putting another one, I'll just put these in curly brackets so that you will remember. So the most general case is you have some set of random variables, x1, x2, xp, and you can say that they are conditionally independent of some xp plus 1, xq, conditioned on another set, xq plus 1 through x pqr, xr. Some set of random variable is condition independent of another set of random variables conditioned on yet another set of random variables. Of course, these sets can have only one value or even zero values. So this brings us to this. You can think of this as a special case of conditional, independent, conditional independence conditioned on the null set. So you can write it like this. Which says that regular independence is just a special case of conditional independence. And because I mentioned that as you change the conditioning, this may change from being true to being false. Changing it to the null set can also change it from being true to being false. And each one of these has a corresponding information theory statement. Questions? Okay, now we're going to move to thinking about machine learning in terms of statistical inference. Um, the main concepts that we discussed in machine learning were inductive bias, broken down into uh, hard bias and soft bias, and um, consistency. Given a hypothesis, given training data, is the data consistent with the hypothesis? Either it was or it wasn't. In fact, any particular data item in your training data uh, was either consistent with the hypothesis or not. We're going to take these two concepts of inductive bias and consistency and generalize them. So, um, the, first of all, hard bias says, hard inductive bias, says either H um, is in H or H is not in H. 
Harding Lecter bias told you which hypothesis to keep in your hypothesis space and which not. So it was a very black and white decision. You had to decide in advance, you're going to throw away many, many potential hypotheses uh, because of the way you defined your hypothesis space. And then the soft bias uh, was sometimes expressed in terms of ordering or rank. We're going to replace both of these guys with a single concept called the prior. A prior over the hypothesis, which would be a number. Um, and it fulfills both of these hard and soft properties. In fact, when the number is zero, it's like a hard bias. When the number is not zero, the larger the number, the higher you are in the ranking or in the preference. So prior will replace both, and it has the meaning that you are familiar with, uh, I think, from your high school statistics or something, of either capturing your, uh, capturing your prior belief about how likely each hypothesis is to be true. So no more need to discuss hard and soft bias. We can talk about a prior. Similarly, the concept of consistency, it was a function of a particular hypothesis space and a particular training data. It was either yes or no, consistent or not consistent. Contradict, the hypothesis is contradicted by the training example or not contradicted, right? This is going to be generalized to the notion of a likelihood. A likelihood function, likelihood of the data given the hypothesis, is again a number. So instead of it being a black or white decision, it's a graduated continuous decision, or continuous assessment. How likely is this data point given or rather, how likely is the label of this data point given the hypothesis and the covariates of this data point? Remember that these data points are labeled, so they have an input and an output. And likelihood captures how likely is the output of this data point given the hypothesis and the input of the data point. Likelihood is also familiar to you. Uh, it's a conditional probability distribution. Um, conditioned on the hypothesis, it is a distribution over the labels of the data point. So I should actually write this a little bit better. This is actually, we write it like this, but I want you to think that it means, it means the probability of the output or the label given the hypothesis and the input. So this is the input of D, and this is the label of D. So this brings us to Bayes' equation. How many of you have heard of Bayes' equation? The rest of you don't speak English? How many of you have heard of Bayes' equation? How many of you have not heard of Bayes' equation? Really? Okay, that's not good. You'll hear about it now. Okay, Bayes' equation is the fundamental basis of all of science, really. It is a way of taking your prior belief about the possible states of the world and your evidence, your data, and using it to update. Yeah. Here? I shouldn't write in such a sloppy way, I apologize. Actually, this means the probability of the label of the training point uh, that you have conditioned on a particular hypothesis and the input of that training point. So the training point D 
The training example D consists of an input and a label. And we are in the likelihood function, we're assuming that the input is given and asking about the label. Bayes' equation. Um, for those of you who have seen it before, or who know what it is, how many of you can come to the board and write it out? I'm sorry? You mean to write out the equation? Yeah, you can. You can. You can? I'm not going to, okay, let me preface it. I'm not going to ask you to do it. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you to do it. How many of you think that you could if I asked you? Okay, that's better. You should all be able to do it with your eyes closed, in your sleep, when you have high fever, with your hands tied behind your back. You should still be able to do that. This is the most fundamental equation of science, okay? And I'm going to show you today how to do it, how to derive it so that you, you get it right every time. Remember that you have two players here. You have a hypothesis and you have data. And for now, I'm going to ignore the fact that the data has an input and a label. I'll just call it data. You're going to start by writing down something that looks like a joint probability function, joint over both the hypothesis and the data. I'll write big D for however, whatever kind of data you have. OK? The next step is I'm going to use the chain rule to break it down using left to right chain rule. So it's going to be probability of H times probability of D given H. You can do that, right? I'm going to use the chain rule again, but this time right to left. I'm going to start with P of D, P of the data times P of H given the data. And now I have one more step. I take this equals to this. I isolate one thing out of it and express it in terms of the others. Which thing is going to be? Let's give them names. Where is the prior? Which of these four things is called the prior? The prior is the distribution over hypotheses before I saw the data, my belief about the world before I saw any data. Let's do seance, push my hand. Ouija board, is that what it's called? Okay, here, okay. This is the prior, prior. Okay, where's the likelihood? Likelihood is the probability of the data given a hypothesis. This is the likelihood. So what is this? It is the probability distribution over the hypotheses given the data. It's my belief about the possible states of the world after I saw the data. It's called the posterior. I'm left with this. I can give it a name if you want. It's a relatively minor player. It's called the evidence. It's the probability of the data, regardless of which hypothesis was the correct one. All right, now which one should I isolate? Let's think of a Bayes rule as a machine, sometimes called the Bayes machine. For updating my beliefs about the world in the presence of data which is what scientists are supposed to do. So into the machine comes my prior belief about the world, my belief before I saw the data, 
out of the machine comes my posterior belief about the world what I believe about the world after seeing the data and the state of the world is I associate it with the state of the hypothesis you know which hypotheses are more likely which are less likely this is P of H now this is not going to happen by itself it needs two more comp components one component it needs is the data itself the second component it needs is somehow relating the data to the hypotheses. A way of, when you see the data, making some hypo you know, figuring out that some hypotheses are more likely than others, or that some hypotheses are more, have better agreement with the data than others. That's the likelihood function. L likelihood function measures the agreement of the data with any one hypothesis. That's P of D given H. So the output of the base machine is the posterior. And we'll go back to our equation. This is what we're trying to isolate. I'll isolate it here. P of H given D is equal to this times this divided by this. P of H times P of D given H divided by P of D. And this is Bayes' rule or Bayes' formula. Now tonight, tie your hands before, behind your back before you go to sleep, set the alarm for 3 a.m. and uh, see if you can do it. I'll write it again here. Because I want to expand it a little bit. I'll write it with slightly different notation. Um, just to familiarize you with um, notation used in, in uh, probability theory, the prior P of H, because it's a special distribution, it's, it's, it's the prior distribution, sometimes we use a separate, a different letter to indicate it. We use the letter pi, the Greek letter pi. So that would be pi of H. Similarly, the likelihood is a very special function. We sometimes use the letter L for likelihood. So it would be L of data given H, but they mean the same thing. They're prob probability distributions. And here we'll have probability of H given the data. That's the posterior equals prior times likelihood divided by the evidence. I'm going to write the evidence in a slightly different way. I'm going to spell it out. It's supposed to be P of D. I'm going to use the uh, law of total probability to open that up as a sum over all the H's in H of P of H times P, P of the given H. You can do that for any random variable. In this case, we're doing it for H. This is a prior. This is the likelihood. So I'll write them here summation over prior of H, and because I have H here, I'll use a different letter here, I'll call it H, H bar. This is quantified over, this is bounded here, this is not, times the likelihood of the data given H bar. So this is another common form of base formula. You know, these formulas have been written millions of times before. If you just Google them, you'll get them so many times. This is not... Um, now, if the hypothesis space is not discrete, then instead of summation, there would be an integral here. Let me write that as well. 
would be an integral over pi of h prime times likelihood of data given h prime d h prime. Integration in the continuous space of hypothesis. Why do I say this is the base of science? Because science comes up with hypotheses and then tests them. Sometimes uh, scientific experiments uh, have very clear violation of some hypotheses. Sometimes the hypothesis are very clearly binary or, or something else, but the data clearly is inconsistent with some of them. That will correspond to a likelihood function that is zero. It says, under this hypothesis, conditioned on this hypothesis, this data cannot happen. And if it happened, probably it means the hypothesis is wrong. But many times, in the real world of real measurements and real noise and confounding factors and so forth, the softer kinds of science, maybe not physics, um, but these days even physics uh, is probabilistic, uh, the beliefs about the world are expressed in such a way that data may or may not directly contradict them, but they just make them more likely or less likely. So the view of a scientist as a Bayes machine is a very good way of thinking about what scientists do. They start with some hypotheses about the world. Some of them they believe more, some of them they believe less. Typically, they're out to test a given hypothesis, which means this is the hypothesis they believe is right. And then its alternative is they believe, maybe believe is wrong. They run an experiment. This gives them data. They feed it through the Bayes machine, and they get a posterior. The posterior is their updated view of the world. Now, here's the interesting thing. Today's posterior is tomorrow's prior. Posterior and prior are really the same kind of beast. They're both summarizing your probabilistic view of the, of the true state of the world. The difference is prior is before you saw the current data, posterior is after you saw the current data. But once you have the posterior in your hand, in a sense you don't need a prior anymore, and you don't need the data that you saw anymore. It summarizes everything that you need to move on in life. And you indeed move on, and you encounter new data. And now the posterior from the old data becomes the prior for the new data. And putting it through the machine again, you get updated and you get yet a new posterior that is your most up-to-date view of the world. So this is why we call it base updating. You update your beliefs by feeding in more and more data. There are some deep philosophical criticisms of this view. One of them is, where does the prior come from? Where does the prior come from? An initial assumption, like a guess, sometimes. Um, an initial assumption is another word for a prior. So it doesn't really answer the question. A guess is an interesting uh, statement. It says it's arbitrary, capricious. Yeah, arbitrary, and you would hope that over time it would converge to, the, to a prior that's more accurate. Ah, so uh, you're saying it's arbitrary, but you hope that over time it will move to something more real in the world. So, so that won't be a, a property of the prior itself. It will be a property of the update that Maybe, regardless of what prior you start with, if you see enough data, the posterior will eventually uh, become reasonable. Yeah, I guess I'm saying if your base machine is always going to converge to a true posterior, then it doesn't matter what your initial prior is, given enough time to overcome the errors in your guess. Uh, this, you're bringing up a very good question. Under what conditions would the base machine converge to the true posterior? Assuming you're in a world where there is a true posterior. Under what conditions will Bayes' formula converge, or Bayes' updating converge with enough data to the right thing? Yes, spoken like a true mathematician. The um, correct hypothesis, 
must be in the support of the original prior. Another way of saying it is it must be assigned a non-zero probability in the original prior. If a given hypothesis is assigned zero in the original prior, no amount of data is going to resurrect it. It will always have zero in all the posteriors. You can see that um, from the update formula. If a given hypothesis has zero here, it'll definitely have zero here, a given h. So we have to be careful what we assign zero to. This is equivalent to the decision about the hard bias. Once you make a hard bias decision, you throw away all these hypotheses forever. You're not going to get them back. That is a necessary but not sufficient condition. What else must be non-zero? It's a product here. This has to be non-zero too for a hypothesis to survive. That means a hypothesis that is contradicted by the data, as in a likelihood of the data, of the actual data that you have, your training data, uh, being zero according to the hypothesis will also die. And once it dies, it will not come back. So that means your likelihood function has to be right also. This is actually a stronger statement, but it's true. Your likelihood function has to be right too. So there, you can prove that if you start with the correct likelihood function and with a non-zero prior over your entire space of interest, with enough data, as the amount of data goes to infinity, you will converge on the right posterior. Now, back to the real world. In the real world, we have a finite amount of data. And so the choice of which prior we start with can matter. And the question is, how do we choose our prior? How about the way we choose our inductive bias? Namely, depends on the domain and on what we believe about the domain before we see the specific data that we're going to work with. It doesn't have to be before we see any data in the world. It just has to be before we see the data that we're about to feed into the prior in the base machine. So it could be informed by data we saw before. And it could be informed by data that's not exactly the kind of data that we're working with, but that we believe is similar. Specifically, you can take a posterior from one kind of phenomena and say, I think this phenomena is very similar to the phenomena I'm modeling, so I'll use that posterior as my prior. You can bring anything to bear that you think is relevant, which is an advantage, but also a flaw, because it's highly subjective, right? Priors are subjective, just like inductive bias is subjective. You choose two different inductive biases, and you will get different results. You choose decision trees, try to minimize the size of the tree. You choose neural network, try to minimize the number of hidden units as a soft bias. You end up with different functions with the same training data. You choose different priors, you end up with different posteriors. So Bayes updating, as powerful as it is, is a bit problematic um, because it has a subjective starting point. So two reasonable people may disagree, which means if you think about it, if you're going to use statistical methodology to make decisions in the public domain, public sphere, like government regulations and um, um, government policy decisions, um, using Bayesian methods to do that is a bit problematic because different people could start with different priors. And in fact, you could even, if you're an interested party, if you're trying to advocate for a particular position, you can figure out which prior to start with um, that would give you the right answer. So Bayesian thinking, this kind of update has been around for 250 years, 
But starting about 100 years ago, this problem became severe enough that an alternative way of thinking about statistics emerged called frequentist statistics. And frequentist statistics does not use priors. We're not going to talk about it much. I just want you to be aware that there's these two ways of doing business in statistics. And of course, they have a lot of overlap, but uh, they have a very different way of thinking, and they deliver very different kinds of results. You can think of Bayes' update not as a statement about uh, what is correct, but as a statement about consistency, logical consistency. What Bayes' formula tells you is, if you believed this before you saw the data, this being the prior distribution, if you believe this, and you believe that the data behaves according to this likelihood function, that's a big important if. So if you believe the prior and, if you, and the likelihood, and you saw this data, then you must believe the posterior now. It's a logical consequence of your prior beliefs. In order to be consistent, if you believed this about the hypothesis before, the prior, you must believe the posterior now. So it's an if-then machine, not a machine that gives you the truth. If you start with something that's wrong, you may very well end up with something that's wrong, subject to the comment that with enough data uh, and with the right conditions, you will converge to the truth. Question. Let's say we've been given a data set. Mm -hmm. How do we calculate likelihood probability of the given edge? Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't know the edge. I mean, we didn't know the edge in the first place. So, um, so how do you calculate the likelihood um, of data? And the answer is it all depends on what H says. So you're right, we didn't specify it. And we'll specify it now with examples. All right, um, suppose we started with the prior, and suppose we fed it the likelihood function and fed it data and turned the crank of the base machine and got out a posterior. Typically, the way we think of machine learning problems is uh, at the end, you end up with a single hypothesis, namely with a single function that you learned, such as a particularly trained neural network or a particular decision tree or a particular linear regression model or any of the others that we're going to touch on. Any one of these corresponds to one particular little h. So we think of the output of machine learning being a single hypothesis. Bayes doesn't give you an output as a single hypothesis. It gives you a distribution over hypothesis, the posterior. Suppose you really want a single hypothesis. So Bayes gave you a distribution, P of H given D, How do we use it to choose a single hypothesis? Your boss just hired you for a zillion dollars, wants you to give them back a single function that they can apply. Hypothesis is a function, right? It's a function of input, produces a label. What would you do? Okay, so one reasonable heuristic is if you have to choose one hypothesis, choose the one that has the highest value of the posterior, the one that you're more, most uh, sure about or most uh, think is most likely to be correct. It's not the only thing we can do, but it makes sense if you have to choose one. That would be argmax over all hypotheses in H of this thing. This rule of choosing the maximum posterior is known the maximum a posteriori rule. We'll write it here as H M A P, maximum a posteriori. I will write it. It's also called the MAP hypothesis. I will also spell it out. Um, this is argmax 
or h in h of the prior over h times the likelihood of the data given h divided by the probability of the data, the evidence. Can you simplify it? This part does not contain h, does not depend on h, does not participate in the maximization. So we can cross it out. So the map hypothesis is the one that among all possible hypotheses maximizes the product of the prior and the likelihood. One very commonly used prior when you know no way to distinguish between hypotheses is to use a uniform prior. Uniform prior assigns the same probability to all hypotheses. Special case prior is uniform. which means the prior value of any hypothesis is constant, which in this case would be one over the size of the hypothesis space. Every member of the hypothesis space gets the same value, so it's one over, one over that size. And then, if the prior is constant, does not depend on h, we are left just with this part. So this becomes, then H map becomes the arg max over all H of just this part, likelihood with data given hypothesis. Namely, the hypothesis that has the highest likelihood among all hypotheses, that gives the likelihood function its highest value. This particular thing is also called the maximum likelihood hypothesis. Maximum likelihood hypothesis would be the map hypothesis in the special case where the prior is uniform. It turns out that maximum likelihood hypothesis is actually important in its own right. Remember the other school of thought that doesn't believe in priors, the frequentists? Well, the frequentists, when they come to play this game, they don't have a prior, they don't believe in priors, they say they don't exist, but they do believe in likelihood, and they do everything based on likelihood. And one of the most common and powerful tools of the frequentists is the maximum likelihood principle and the maximum likelihood estimation and maximum likelihood choice. And you can prove many interesting guarantees um, based on maximum likelihood. So maximum likelihood is a good principle in its own right, but it can also be seen as a special case of map estimation when the prior is uniform. Did you have a question? Yeah. Um. So over finite hypothesis space, MLE is mapped with the, the uniform prior. Mm -hmm. But MLE makes sense even when you have the continuous or infinite hypothesis space. Mm -hmm. There's no uniform prior there. Right. Is there a way to make that, to have an analogous map? Very interesting question. In continuous hypothesis, in, in discrete hypothesis spaces, we know what happened. In continuous hypothesis spaces, you can still define an MLE over a continuous space. Um, can you define a map there? And the answer is uh, you can, but not uniform, right? Well, actually, it could be continuous, could be uniform, but unbounded is really what you meant. Um, it's actually worse than that. Um, okay, so for the first question you ask is, in an unbounded space, what would the MLE correspond to in the Bayesian term? And I don't know that it corresponds to anything. It's but the, another interesting thing is that um, what it means to be uniform in a space is not that well defined. You can define uniformity in different ways. For example, if you have 
if your space is a circle, um, you can choose a point in the circle uniformly by choosing x and y. And as long as x squared plus y squared is less than the radius of the circle, you choose that point. That's one way of choosing uniformly in that space. Another way of choosing uniformly in that space, so this is big R, another way of choosing uniformly in the space is using uh, polar coordinates. Uh, you can choose some R and some theta. You choose R uniformly between 0 and big R, and you choose theta uniformly between 0 and 2 pi, and this gives you a point in the space. Well, these are not the same distributions, but they both can be called uniform distributions. It would lead to different answers. Not in our course, but interesting nonetheless. Okay. Um, I, um, I went through all of Bayes' thinking with H being my hypothesis. Very often what happens in statistical estimation uh, as well as in machine learning, uh, sometimes we do not hypothesis estimation but parameter estimation. It's kind of the same thing because we define our family of hypothesis as basically being a parametric family that is indexed by a parameter. So an example of that would be uh, I want to understand, do I, I don't carry coins anymore, I used to carry coins. I, I have a coin and I want to know the probability of it falling on head or I want to know, you know the probability of any particular sequence of flips. I'm going to make the assumption that the flips are independent and that they all have the same probability of head. So this is called, this is the Bernoulli assumption that leading to Bernoullian binomial distribution. So I'm going to assume that the outcome of the coin comes from the family of Bernoulli, parameterized by one parameter, probability of head. Here's another example. Uh, I have a collection of data points from the real line. I might assume that it comes from a Gaussian. But I don't know the mean or the standard deviation of that Gaussian. So I'm assuming that the correct explanation, the true hypothesis, is one particular Gaussian with one particular mean and standard deviation. I just don't know which. So my H in that case would be all Gaussians all Gaussians um, with some mu and some standard deviation. This is an example of a parametric family. This one is indexed by two parameters, mu and sigma. The example of flipping the coin, they're indexed by one parameter, p, probability of head. You can have families that are indexed by one, two, or many, many more parameters. I'd like you to make this mapping in your head that these families, these parametric families, are essentially hypothesis spaces. Now, I'm beginning to answer your question. The likelihood function will come from the definition of that family. If my family is a Gaussian, the likelihood function will be the likelihood of a particular data point coming from a particular Gaussian with a particular value of the parameters. So parameter estimation can be viewed in the same, um, the same lens. Uh, I should mention that statistics deals also with non-parametric estimation, and so does machine learning, given that they're highly overlapping. So now we're going to talk about parametric estimation, where we look at hypotheses as being represented by particular values of parameters. And the hypothesis space is the family of all hypotheses that can be represented that way. So I want to take the maximum likelihood um, hypothesis or method and work out an example of how we might use it. <laughs> 
maybe a couple of examples. So suppose um, our hypothesis space is all where newly distributions um, with probability probability of head is um, call it theta. This is basically saying a coin has some fixed probability of landing on head. And that theta could be anywhere between 0 and 1. This is my hypothesis space. Now suppose I'm looking at a sequence of n flips of a coin. So my data is n flips of a coin. So it could be something like head, tail, tail, head, head, tail, whatever, a sequence of n flips. My likelihood function likelihood of the data given a hypothesis. Now, the hypothesis is indexed by theta. So I've, I'm going to switch now and describe my hypothesis not with a little h, but with theta. But it means the same thing. In fact, sometimes my family would have more than one parameter, and then there would be theta 1, theta 2, theta 3, I will, call, I will take this vector of thetas and just call it theta. So theta is not necessarily a single parameter. It's a vector of parameters. I'll convert this into theta. And it's also conditioned on a particular number of flips of the, of the coins, because this was decided before I saw the data. And the answer here is the binomial formula. Um, okay, now I have to define what my data means. So I'll simplify my life. Um, n flips of a coin, my data is the number of heads, which I will call k. So there's a subtle distinction here between view my outcome as the number of heads or do I view it as a particular sequence of when a head occurred and when a tail occurred. I'm going to skip over that. It's an interesting question. I'm going to skip over that and cons be concerned only with, uh, I will look at the outcome of the experiment as the number of heads I got, regardless of when they, where they occurred. The number of heads I got could be any number between 0 and n, right? So th my data is just the number k. And I can replace, in fact, I replace d here with k. So it's the likelihood of k conditioned on the unknown parameter and something that I decided before I started my experiment. Now I can write this using the Bayesian formula, which is n choose k, theta to k, 1 minus theta to n minus k. And if you didn't know Bayes' formula, I hope you at least knew the binomial formula. I'm now going to apply the maximum likelihood principle to derive the maximum likelihood estimate or the maximum likelihood answer to the problem of what theta ought to be. Theta maximum likelihood. I'll introduce one other piece of notation. In the statistical estimation theory, it is very common to put a little hat over the parameter to indicate that this is not the real value of the parameter, it's the estimate based on the data. In other words, it's the output of our calculations in this case. So to be completely consistent, I should do it here too. 
I'm looking for the maximum in the value of theta in this range of the likelihood expression. Well, instead of copying this whole thing over here, let me start by simplifying it. Is there any part of this that I can throw away that does not participate in the maximization? Yeah, I'm, the maximization is over theta, so anything that does not involve theta is not going to affect the multiplication, so I can cross this guy out, right? So this becomes theta to the k times 1 minus theta to the n minus k. Always simplify these argmax expressions. I can't simplify it anymore, but I'm going to use my second trick that I often use in maximum likelihood derivation. I'm going to take the log of this expression. Um, the reason I can do that is because log is a monotonically increasing function. So whatever value of the parameters maximizes the original expression is also the same value that maximizes the log of that expression. So I can write and be mathematically correct that this is the same as argmax over theta of the log of this. And I will write the log of this as k times the log of theta um, plus n minus k times the log of 1 minus theta. So I simplified by removing uh, factors that do not involve the thing I'm maximizing over. And then I took the log. Now I'm going to apply the third uh, step, which I usually apply in maximum likelihood derivation, and that, and that is to take the derivative of this and equate it to zero. I'm trying to find the derivative of this with regard to theta. I'm trying to find a maximum. So I'll take the derivative, equate it to zero, and then I have to, once I find one or more solutions, I have to take a second derivative to make sure it's a maximum, not a minimum. So the derivative of this would be, um, with regard to theta, would be k times derivative of log of theta is 1 over theta, plus derivative of this with regard to theta is this times the derivative of this. So it's n minus k, derivative of log of 1 um, over theta, uh, uh, log of 1 minus theta is 1 over 1 minus theta times the internal derivative of 1 minus theta, which is negative 1. So if it's negative 1, I will just convert this plus into a minus, and I will say this is equal to 0. And if this is equal to 0, it's like saying that this is equal to this. I'll write it again here. k over theta equals n minus k over 1 minus theta. I will now cross multiply this times this equals this times this. So I get k times 1 minus theta equals n minus k times theta. I will open the parentheses. k minus k theta equals n theta minus k theta. I'll cross out the common terms. I have k equals n theta, or theta maximum likelihood is k over n. Wow! If you flip a coin n times and you get k heads, k over n is a very good answer. But you knew that, right? This is your high school answer. But at least now you've got theoretical justification of what kind of answer it is. If you flip a coin 10 times and you get 6 heads, it doesn't mean the probability of head is 0 0.6. 0 0.6 is just the frequency of head in your data. The probability of head could be 0 0.55, could be 0 0.63, could be 0 0.7, could be 0 0.1, could be anything. But 0 0.6 is the maximum likelihood estimate, the maximum likelihood hypothesis. which is also the maximum posterior hypothesis if you have a uniform prior. Whether you should have a uniform prior for a coin is a different question. <laughs>
I went through this uh, in order to show you how we derive maximum likelihood answers because maybe the most common thing in machine learning theory is when you start and write down a model and say, okay, how am I going to estimate the parameters of this model? By far the most common answer, the first com answer that comes to your mind is maximum likelihood. Apply the maximum likelihood principle. Sometimes the derivation is going to be a lot more complicated than this one. Sometimes you start a derivation, you get stuck, the, you don't find a solution. It doesn't mean one doesn't exist, it just means you cannot find a closed form solution. Sometimes you can find a solution by iterative procedure. Sometimes there is no solution, there is no maximum value. The, any of these things can happen. All right, let's do another ex um, example. Or maybe not, let's not, I'll do that next time. I'd like to move on to something else so that you can start on your assignment. Um, this is the world of parametri parametric learning. Let me go back to the non-parametric learning. Um, and back to the world of medicine. Suppose you're a doctor and you're seeing a patient who just had a test done for cancer. And the result of the test was positive, suggesting that the person has cancer. And you try, but the test is not 100% foolproof. It can sometimes make mistakes. So you're trying to determine um, how likely is it that the person has cancer. Okay? We're going to put the story into Bayes terms. We start Bayes by listing the possible hypotheses. And in this case, there are only two hypotheses. Patient has cancer or patient does not have cancer. I will indicate it with a C or a C bar not cancer. The next thing we're going to do is define a prior over this hypothesis, prior over H. What is the prior probability of the person having cancer? Well, uh, prior means before seeing the test result. You go to the literature and you find that this particular kind of cancer is fairly rare, only 0.8% of the population has that cancer at any one time. Okay, somehow you find that. So, um, probability of, of pi of cancer is 0 0.008, 0.8%, and pi of not cancer is, of course, 1 minus that, so it's 0 0.992. You specify the hypothesis space, you specify the prior. The next thing to specify is the nature of the data. The data in our case is a single test result. The test result could be positive or negative. In our case, it's positive. This is how doctors write positive test results. There's also a negative test result, but that's not what you got. But these are the only two possible results coming out of the test. Now we need to specify the likelihood. Likelihood function is a function of the data given the hypothesis. The data in principle could be positive test results or negative test result. The hypothesis could be the person has cancer or doesn't have cancer. All combinations are possible, so you need to specify it in the two by two table. Let's build a two by two table. Cancer, no cancer. Positive, negative test result. Which way uh, should sum to one, the rows or the columns? How does the likelihood sum to one when you sum or integrate over this or over this? You guys are refusing to think. Columns. Columns. 
namely this plus this should be 1. Why? These are the only options. Hmm. So, you're saying if a person got a positive result, either they have cancer or they don't have cancer, and the two possibilities should sum to one. That is true, but it's not what the likelihood function captures. This is what the posterior captures. The posterior of cancer given a positive outcome plus not cancer given a positive outcome must be 1. This is the posterior which is written as hypothesis given data. So we sum over the hypothesis to get 1. But the likelihood is the data given the hypothesis. The likelihood says that if the person has cancer, then the test result would come back either positive or negative, one or the other. And the probabilities of both must sum to one. In fact, it's true not just for cancer, but also for non-cancer, for, for any age. For any age any one of the two ages. When you have a conditional probability distribution like this one, the sum to one always applies to the thing that's being conditioned, not to the thing that's being conditioned on. A probability distribution is over this. This is just a conditioning event. All right, let's fill this table. Um, so if the person has cancer, almost always the test comes back positive. But on rare occasions, 2% of the time when people have cancer, the test fails to detect it. So there will be 0 0.02 here. Um, that's pretty good for a test. This is called a false negative. False negative. Or a miss. The person has cancer, but you missed it. The test missed it. When the person does not have cancer, almost always the test correctly says, comes back negative. 97% of the time. But 3% of the time, it comes back with a false positive. It claims, yes, it's a positive result, even though the person truly doesn't have cancer. This is called a false positive. These are positives. So this is a true positive, false positive. These are negative results. True, true negative, false negative. False negatives are known as misses. False positives are known as false alarms. Right? You raise the alarm. You scare the patient, but really they don't have cancer. We specify the prior, we specify the likelihood. The problem is well specified, we can apply Bayes', Bayes uh, formula now to derive a posterior. Now, if you were the doctor and you had in your hand this very, very accurate test, the, text, the test is right almost always. Its error rate is somewhere between 2 and 3 percent, right? For people with cancer, it's 2 percent. For people without cancer, it's 3 percent. On average, it's somewhere between 2 and 3. So it's almost always right. You ran the test, it came back positive. What do you think? Does the patient have cancer? Most likely. What's the MAP hypothesis? Just guess. You don't want to guess. All right, don't guess.
All right, we're going to derive the posterior here. Since the actual test result was positive, I will derive the probability of H given positive. And I'm not going to derive it for all H's, I'm going to derive it for one of them, for the probability of cancer, knowing that the probability of not cancer would be 1 minus this. Bayes' rule, remember your hands behind your back, your eyes closed. Prior times likelihood divided by evidence. Prior is the prior over the hypothesis, which is C. Likelihood is the likelihood of the current test, the positive given C. Evidence is the probability of positive. But I'm going to spell it out the way I showed over there as a sum over both possible hypotheses. There are only two hypotheses, so it's a very simple sum. It would look like this. Prior of cancer times likelihood of positive given cancer plus prior of not cancer times likelihood of, can of positive given not cancer. This is always the case with base formula, that when you spell the evidence out, each term looks like what's above the line. Each term in the denominator looks like the enumerator. In the general case, I will not spell it out like this. I would use a summation because there are too many cases. But here, there are only two hypotheses, so I spelled them out. All right, we can plug the numbers in. Prior over cancer is 0 0.008. And the likelihood um, of positive given cancer is 0 0.98. And here I'm going to get 0 0.008 times 0 0.98 plus the prior over non-cancer, which is 0 0.992 times the likelihood of a positive given not cancer. Likelihood of a positive given not cancer is 0 0.03. When I plug it into my calculator, what this will give me is, given that I observed a positive test result, what is my estimate of the probability that the per person actually has cancer? And the answer is, unless it changed since last year, to 0 0.085, about 21% that they have cancer, which means that there's about 79% chance that they don't have cancer. P of not cancer given positive is 1 minus P of cancer given positive. It's 0 0.7915. This is 79%. This is 21%. So the patient is far more likely to not have cancer. In fact, almost four times as likely to not have cancer as to have cancer. That doesn't make any sense. You use the very accurate test that is wrong only rarely. The test clearly said positive. And you still think it's much more likely the person does not have cancer? Why? Because the prior is low. Look at what we have here. We have a fight between a prior and a likelihood. Prior, likelihood, prior, likelihood. If you look only at the likelihood, if there was no prior, you would have 0 0.98 divided by 0 0.98 plus 0 0.03. Clearly, overwhelmingly close to 1. 
If you looked only at a prior, you'll have 0.008 divided by 0.008 plus 0.992, clearly very close to zero. The prior and the likelihood are pulling in opposite directions. And the likelihood wins in this case. So this is not a trick, this is a real logical consequence of the fact that cancers are rare. When cancers are rare, even a very accurate test does not mean that you have cancer. It's very nice to see it in a uh, pictorial form. These are all the people who have cancer. These are all the people who don't have cancer. Remember, this is 0.8% of our space. Among the people who have cancer, almost all of them got a positive test result. But these here got a negative test result. Among all the people who don't have cancer, almost all of them get a negative test result, but a small number, 3%, get a positive test result. Now you are told that the patient got a positive test result, which means they're somewhere either here or here. If I drew this to scale, since this is 0 0.08, 0 0.008 is 0.8%, this is tiny, and this is 3%. This is wider. So given that they have a positive test result, they're far more likely to be here. In fact, they're four times more likely to be here than they are to be here. So here's the question I want to leave you with. You're the doctor. The patient comes in with the test result. It's positive. What do you tell them? And what do you do? I will see you on Monday. I hope you're more awake than I was disappointed by your lack of participation. Kudos to those who did participate, but I want many more to participate. If you're dragging yourself, I'm sorry? Yes, the homework should be out today. Uh, there may be, I don't remember for sure if we covered everything you need for that. I think we did. Uh, but if you see a concept you're not familiar with, wait until Monday. I don't, I don't think there should be any. I'm sorry?